We often look for methods to quantify muscle growth as a way to assess if we are making progress or not. There are many different ways to do so, but all have their inherent limitations and no method is perfect. So what are the best ways to measure muscle growth over time? Are there any methods that can do this accurately enough to rely on? And is it even worth trying to assess muscle growth in the first place? To answer these questions, we first need to look at the average time course that muscle growth follows. It is generally accepted that muscle growth tends to follow a diminishing returns relationship with training time. Our rate of muscle growth is fastest initially and then slows down over time. This doesn't mean muscle growth does not occur as an advanced lifter, it just means the rate of growth will likely be slower. This also assumes that training is maximally effective from day one in the gym, which it almost always isn't. So in reality, as we make improvements to our training and diet practices over time, and are maybe less consistent at other times, we might see spikes and plateaus at different points throughout our lifting journeys. In either case, the reason for this discussion is that it will influence how we measure muscle growth. If you take measurements before you begin lifting, and after a few months of consistent training, you will almost certainly see significant growth by almost any half-reliable measurement. However, if you measure muscle growth after a few months in a lifter who has been training consistently for over 10 years, muscle growth is likely to be very small and might not be detected by most methods of assessment. This is because the gains we would expect at this stage are usually going to be smaller than the margin of error of the assessment method. So as an advanced lifter, the measurement method needs to be more accurate and or the time frame between assessments needs to be longer in order to reliably detect muscle growth. It is also important to understand the influence of body weight and body fat when measuring muscle growth. In most cases, being at a heavier body weight or a higher body fat percentage will allow you to carry more muscle mass compared with being lighter and leaner. Of course, this isn't always the case as muscle mass will also be influenced by other factors such as resistance training, protein intake and genetics, but it is usually the case. For example, this classic study compared the body composition of three different populations. These were 37 sumo wrestlers, 14 bodybuilders and 26 untrained men. Sumo wrestlers were the heaviest at an average of around 116 kilograms, bodybuilders were around 84 kilograms, and the untrained men were 61 kilograms. In terms of body composition, the sumo wrestlers had the most fat-free mass, but also the highest body fat percentage at around 26%. Bodybuilders had 10 kilograms less fat-free mass, despite their primary goal being to build muscle, but were also much leaner at around 11% body fat and untrained men had much lower fat-free mass and were relatively lean at around 12% body fat. With each group, there was a pretty clear relationship between total body weight and fat-free mass, with heavier individuals carrying more fat-free mass. In fact, this same relationship was seen at a population level in this study, which measured the body composition of nearly 500 males and females between 18 to 88 years of age. As we can see, there was a pretty clear effect of total body weight and muscle mass for both men and women. Heavier individuals carry more muscle mass. And this isn't just a result of height either. This graph shows that heavier individuals also had a lower proportion of muscle mass as a percentage of their total body weight, meaning that heavier people generally had more body fat too. So does this mean we should just gain lots of body weight to maximize muscle mass at all costs? Well, probably not. The goal of exercise and diet isn't to record the highest fat-free mass on an arbitrary measurement, it is to improve health, function, aesthetics, strength, or whatever your goals may be. Gaining body weight will likely increase the amount of fat-free mass you carry, although it will also increase body fat in most cases too. And if you were to then reduce body weight, you would likely lose most of this additional fat-free mass that was gained. To further cloud our ability to measure body composition, there is also a difference between fat-free mass or lean mass versus muscle mass. Many methods of measuring body composition use fat-free mass as a general assessment of muscle mass. And this is a decent measure of muscle mass since it makes up the majority of lean mass, but it isn't the only component. This research review showed the approximate proportions of what our body is composed of. Of total body weight, we can split this into lean mass and fat mass. Lean mass can then be categorized as lean soft tissue mass and bone mass. Then lean soft tissue mass can further be broken down into muscle mass and other organs. 
muscle mass can then be assessed at different regions of the body. So essentially, fat-free mass includes muscle, bone, organs, and water, not only muscle mass. And it is common to see small changes in organ and bone mass as we exercise, and if we gain or lose weight. Although these changes probably aren't major, it can potentially mask our ability to detect the small changes in muscle mass we would expect as an advanced lifter. Furthermore, this research review suggested that adipose tissue, i.e. body fat, is somewhat composed of lean mass too. It is estimated that around 85% of adipose tissue is fat, while around 15% is considered lean mass. So even if pure body fat was lost and muscle mass was preserved, most measurement methods would detect this as a decrease in lean mass, which is usually used as a measure of muscle mass. So a loss in body fat would automatically suggest a loss of muscle mass. All of this is to say that when we are assessing muscle growth over time, it would be most helpful for an individual to compare results when they are at the same body weight. This is because at a higher body weight, you will almost certainly have greater lean mass compared with a lower body weight, assuming you are resistance training. And if you were to lose weight, in most cases a reduction in lean mass would be observed. So comparing body composition at the same body weight is probably most accurate since total mass is equated. This would make differences in lean versus fat mass more indicative of true changes in muscle mass. Another consideration for many body composition tests is the influence of nutrition and hydration status. With regards to nutrition, carbohydrate and creatine intake can have an impact on how much muscle mass is detected. Generally, consuming a high carbohydrate diet in the days before a body composition test will usually result in a greater amount of lean mass being recorded compared with a lower carbohydrate intake. Similarly, being loaded with creatine, a common supplement for lifters, will increase muscle mass being recorded too. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of glycogen and creatine loading and depletion on body composition. 18 competitive cyclists from the Australian Institute of Sport had their body composition measured via DEXA multiple times over a 14-day period. This was conducted in a glycogen depleted state, a glycogen loaded state, a creatine loaded state, and a creatine and glycogen loaded state. It was found that in the glycogen depleted state, lean mass was 1.3% lower than baseline. In the glycogen loaded state, lean mass was 2.1% greater than baseline. Creatine loading resulted in a 1.3 increase in lean mass, and glycogen and creatine loading increased lean mass by 3%. Furthermore, water intake also seems to influence body composition testing. Similar to glycogen and creatine, increased water consumption usually records as greater lean mass. Even drinking a glass of water before a body composition scan can significantly alter the results. This was seen in this study, which explored the influence of water ingestion on body composition analysis. 100 volunteers had their body composition assessed via DEXA. They were then given 5 minutes to consume 500 milliliters of water before conducting another DEXA scan immediately after. It was found that after drinking the water, about 600 grams more fat-free mass was recorded and body fat percentage was lower by 0.1%. So essentially, nutrition and hydration can make a significant difference in muscle mass assessment. And some of these effects are probably greater than the actual muscle growth we would expect over a reasonable time frame as an intermediate or advanced lifter. We can control this to some extent by attempting to keep diet practices similar between measurements, but it is still unlikely that it can be controlled perfectly. A good general practice is to have body composition measured early in the day before eating or drinking any food or liquid for reasonably consistent results. With that information out of the way, let's now look at what methods we can use to assess muscle growth over time and which are best to use. There are many different methods and each has its own advantages and limitations. The first and probably easiest is using visual appearance. This refers to simply looking at yourself in the mirror or comparing physique photos over time. The good thing about visual appearance is that it is the most direct assessment of muscle growth related to physique goals. As we have mentioned, the goal isn't to record the highest value on an arbitrary test, it is to look and feel a certain way. So if you are satisfied with your visual appearance, then why does a research grade body composition scan matter? Although if you want to track changes over time, visual appearance is a difficult method to rely on. 
As a beginner, you can probably see visual changes over relatively short periods of time. But as a more advanced lifter, muscle growth is slow and visual changes aren't as obvious. Factors such as lighting, angles, posing, temperature, time of day, glycogen levels, and so on, can all make subtle differences in how you look. And these differences might be larger than the actual muscle growth we are expecting over short to moderate timeframes as an intermediate or advanced lifter. Furthermore, differences in body fat can make it difficult to assess muscle growth too. The majority of our fat sits underneath the skin and on top of our muscles. So having more body fat will reduce muscle definition and less body fat will increase muscle definition. So even if muscle mass has been built, it might not be all that visible if body fat is higher. In most cases, you will look like you have built muscle mass simply by losing body fat, even though chances are that you have less muscle mass when you are leaner. And as an advanced lifter, visual changes in muscle size are only going to be noticeable when you get very lean in most cases. So while it isn't very precise or objective, the best way to use visual appearance to assess muscle growth is by taking pictures with similar lighting, posing, angles, time of day, and camera quality. Compare multiple pictures over long-term timeframes rather than only two pictures taken after a short period of time. Compare pictures at the same body weight or body fat percentage to minimize the influence of body fat masking muscle definition. The next method of assessment we have is girth measurements. This refers to measuring the circumference at various sites around the arms, legs, and torso. In theory, a larger circumference around the arms and legs would indicate muscle growth, since more muscle mass makes the girth of the limbs bigger. However, circumference measures aren't able to differentiate between muscle, fat, or even swelling and inflammation. So, how reliable are girth measurements for predicting muscle growth? This was explored in this study, which compared the correlations between arm circumference measures and arm lean mass measured via DEXA in older men and women. It was found that arm circumference was positively associated with lean mass, but also positively associated with fat percentage. In other words, gaining muscle mass or body fat are both likely to increase arm circumference. Although this was in non-lifting populations and also didn't look at changes in circumference. This study, however, looked at the effects of different bicep training protocols on arm circumference and skin fold thickness measures. Although we don't really care about the specific details of the intervention, it was found that flexed arm circumference increased after training by around 1cm in these two groups. Also, bicep skin fold thickness decreased by a few millimetres simultaneously. This would indicate that the increase in arm circumference was a result of true muscle growth. Another potential issue with girth measurements is the human error factor. It can be difficult to take the measurement in the exact same spot every single time, which might mask the small changes we are expecting. Ideally, you would have an experienced person assist with this, although this might not be viable in many cases. However, over time, you are likely to improve the accuracy and consistency with which you take the measurement. And even if there is some inaccuracy, if you were to take multiple measurements over time, you can look at the average trends to make a more informed assessment. Here are some guidelines for how to best use girth measurements to assess muscle growth. Some common sites to measure are the mid-arm, mid-thigh, upper calf, around the chest, around the hips, and around the waist. Compare the circumferences of all these sites to your waist measurement. Waist measurements are more indicative of changes in body fat, while the other measurements are more indicative of changes in muscle mass. So an increase in limb circumferences, with minimal change or even a decrease in waist circumference, is more likely to indicate muscle growth. And as always, it is going to be most accurate to compare measurements when you are at the same body weight. The next method of assessing muscle growth is via lifting performance. This refers to comparing the load and reps you are able to lift with over time. The idea is that increases in lifting performance over time means that you have grown muscle mass in the prime movers of that lift. And this makes sense in theory, since a bigger muscle has more total contractile tissue to produce force. And more force means we can lift more weight or perform more reps, with all else being equal. While this is true, the issue is that not all other factors are equated all the time. There are two primary factors that can influence lifting performance unrelated to changes in muscle size. The first is neural adaptations. 
our nervous system also adapts to resistance training independent of muscle growth. Adaptations such as increased force production, better coordination and synchronization, and less antagonist muscle activation can all allow us to lift more weight without changing muscle size. So this can essentially be thought of as efficiency. How heavy can we lift with the current muscle mass we have? We are usually going to be more efficient when practicing the same exercise for an extended duration and when lifting heavy loads. Although if we introduce a novel exercise and we are training with higher rep ranges and lighter loads, then our neural efficiency isn't going to be as high. Furthermore, lifting technique also plays a significant role in our lifting performance. Changing our lifting technique can influence the biomechanical leverages of the lift and in turn influence how much load we can use. For strength athletes, they want to use the most mechanically advantageous technique within the constraints of the rules to lift the most weight possible. However, for hypertrophy training, we aren't necessarily trying to lift the most weight possible, we are trying to maximally stress the target muscle group. For example, powerlifters usually squat with a lower bar position, a greater forward lean, and to parallel depth, since this is what allows them to lift the most weight. Although someone focused on muscle growth would probably benefit from squatting deeper with a more upright torso position. The powerlifting style allows you to lift more weight, while the hypertrophy style requires lighter loads. So depending on the context, lifting performance might be more or less correlated with muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of training with different rep ranges and loads on muscle growth and strength. 19 men with an average of 4-5 to five years lifting experience performed 3 sets of the following exercises 3 times per week for 8 weeks. Half the subjects lifted in the 2-4 to four rep range, while the other half lifted in the 8-12 to 12 rep range, with all sets taken to failure in both groups and load adjusted based on the target rep range. It was found that training with moderate loads resulted in slightly superior increases in muscle thickness of the biceps, triceps and quadriceps shown in the orange, compared with the heavy loads shown in the blue. However, the heavy load training resulted in superior increases in 1RM bench press and squat compared with the moderate load training. So there was still a positive correlation with muscle growth and strength in both groups, but muscle growth isn't exclusively predictive of strength gains. This study, however, examined the relationship between muscle mass and strength in 20 elite powerlifters. It was found that there was a strong correlation between squat, deadlift, and bench press 1RM strength with muscle mass, as well as their powerlifting total. And this makes more sense since powerlifters are trying to lift the most amount of weight with the most efficient technique. And since they are already elite level lifters, their neural efficiency is near maximized. So at this level, muscle mass is probably going to be a primary driver of increasing strength. Here are some practical guidelines as to how to best use lifting performance as a gauge for muscle growth. When comparing lifting performance, ensure the technique being used is as similar as possible. Try to compare lifting performance once you have been performing a specific exercise consistently for a while to ensure neural efficiency is high. If you were comparing rep performance across multiple sets, ensure rest periods are the same to minimize differences in set to set fatigue. And as usual, it makes the most sense to compare lifting performance at times when you are at the same body weight. The next methods we can use to assess muscle growth are via DEXA or BIA. These acronyms stand for Dual X-ray Absorptiometry and Bioelectrical Impedance Analysis, respectively. These are different technologies, but are used similarly in practice. Both methods require you to get a quick analysis which provides a breakdown of your body composition, including lean mass, fat mass, bone mass, and so on. Generally, DEXA is thought of as the gold standard for body composition measurement and is often used in research, whereas BIA, depending on the specific manufacturer, usually isn't considered as accurate or reliable as DEXA. This study compared the body composition of 591 healthy adults using both DEXA and BIA. Using DEXA as the reference, BIA tended to overestimate body fat percentage by around 3-5% in leaner males and females. And it also tended to underestimate body fat percentage by around 3% in those with higher body fat compared with DEXA. While lean mass wasn't shown in the results, we would assume there would be similar differences between DEXA and BIA. 
And in terms of changes in body composition, this study assessed changes after a seven-week off-season training program in college football players via both DEXA and BIA. After the off-season, athletes gained a little over one kilogram, which was actually recorded differently between the two methods. Fat-free mass increased based on both methods, with DEXA recording a slightly greater increase than BIA. And a slight decrease in fat mass was recorded by DEXA, while BIA recorded a slight increase. So overall, if you compare the results using the same technology, whether that is DEXA or BIA, changes in body composition seem to be relatively reliable. Although there is probably a margin of error associated with each, particularly BIA, that we should be aware of. For newer lifters, muscle growth over reasonable timeframes will likely be greater than these margins of error. So this will probably be picked up by the scans and is a decent way to assess progress. However, for advanced lifters, this margin of error might be greater than the actual muscle growth we are expecting to see over reasonable timeframes. So changes might be masked by inherent error of the technology. Here are some practical guidelines on how to best use these technologies to assess muscle growth over time. Get scans at a similar time of the day before you eat or drink anything. Make sure you have allowed enough time to actually expect appreciable muscle growth to have occurred, otherwise small changes might get lost in the noise. Only compare body composition results between the same assessment technologies. In other words, don't compare DEXA results to BIA or any other method for that matter. And make sure to compare results when you are at the same body weight. And the last measure of muscle growth we will discuss is muscle thickness. This is where ultrasound is used to literally measure the thickness in millimetres of a specific muscle. This is probably considered the most accurate method of directly assessing growth of specific muscles. For this reason, it is often used in hypertrophy research to assess muscle growth. However, it doesn't assess total body composition, only the local thickness of the muscle. And although it is the most accurate method we have, it still isn't perfect, since it can be influenced by acute swelling and by exactly where the ultrasound is placed on the skin. Although researchers are aware of this and attempt to minimise the effects of these potential errors. In any case, because of the time and skill required, and the expensive equipment used, it isn't usually publicly accessible. So there isn't really any point discussing best practice for this topic, since it is reserved for research labs and medical use anyway. So with all these methods discussed, there is an important question to answer. Do you even need to measure muscle growth at all? Well, the short answer is no. You don't need to measure muscle growth, and whether you measure it or not, probably won't change your results anyway. This is because we follow general principles of training that are derived from decades of research and lifters' experience. Scientific studies usually control other variables much more strictly than we can. They also have larger sample sizes and more accurate methods to measure muscle growth. So maybe it makes more sense to just follow scientific evidence and anecdotes of successful lifters as to what works best, and chances are that you are going to be building muscle mass over time. And even if you aren't, measuring it won't change your results anyway. The reality is that how much muscle we build is largely outside our control. We can do our best with training and nutrition practices, but our response to the stimulus is unmodifiable. That being said, you certainly can measure it if you want. You will just need to use the best practices we have discussed to minimise error margins and be aware of the limitations of each method. Doing so might help you stay motivated, or you might simply be curious to see the results. And in some cases, certain methods might be very useful for your goals. For example, a physique athlete would probably want to assess visual appearance to see if they are looking more muscular and leaner approaching a competition. This is because how you look is literally the sport. If you are looking better, according to the criteria of the federation, you are improving, regardless of whether or not a scan tells you that you've built muscle. With all this information, let's establish some practical recommendations. There are many different methods we can use to estimate muscle growth over time. All have their upsides and downsides, but none of them are perfect. Most methods will be reliable enough to detect changes in muscle mass if significant growth is achieved, such as a new lifter seeing large muscle growth within their first few months of consistent training. However, most of these methods are not going to be reliable enough to detect marginal changes in muscle mass, such as what we would expect from advanced lifters over short-term timeframes. For the most accurate changes in muscle mass that is publicly accessible in most developed locations is DEXA. 
although you would still need to follow best practices to ensure the most reliable measurements, such as comparing results at the same body weight and ensuring nutrition and hydration status are consistent. While we can obsess over how to measure muscle growth most accurately, you certainly don't need to measure muscle growth over time. In most cases, objectively quantifying muscle growth probably isn't going to change what you actually do in practice. You certainly can measure it if you want to, but it won't change the results. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.